First up, one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever made was in the 1970s by workers digging a well in Xi'an, China. Chinese archaeologists were called in and uncovered a jaw-dropping site, a life-size army of 8,000 clay soldiers. Known as the Terracotta Army, they are part of the magnificent three-acre tomb of Qin Shi Huang, China's first emperor, who wanted to live forever. The army was meant to escort the emperor into the afterlife and shows the extraordinary lengths he went to achieve immortality. It's proof of the powerful fascination man has had with forces beyond the Earth's realm for centuries. Even before the Qin Dynasty, on the other side of the globe, evidence exists that ancient empires in the Americas were planning their own spiritual journeys to another life beyond. Correspondent Dan Collins found one such civilization in Peru and takes us to its mountaintop fortress, where artifacts show its attempts to tap into a different dimension. Hidden away in a high mountain valley deep in the Peruvian Andes, this ruin has coexisted with peasant farmers for thousands of years. But only in the last century was this complex of stone structures, terraces and squares revealed to the world. For nearly three decades, Alejandro Espinosa has been both guide and protector of this site. A stonemason, he's expertly restored much of the ruin. Vamos a vivir de turismo. Entonces, turismo es una, hemos pensado que turismo es una mina sin chimenea. Entonces, nosotros tenemos que desarrollar acá en esta zona, de la, en la zona de los Callejones de los Conchucos, en Chavín de Guantar, en, en, en turismo. Entonces, la gente estamos concientizando para educando en tema de turismo y para tener un gran respeto a nuestro sitio arqueológico y también su valor. Chavín receives little more than 50,000 visitors a year a fraction of the million-plus tourists that visit Machu Picchu. The site's economic potential is hindered by a bumpy four-hour drive on a rutted road from the nearest big town. Simple infrastructure improvements could bring in that missing revenue, and many more visitors could see how Chavin was way ahead of its time. Ever since it was first uncovered by Peruvian archaeologist Julio Tello in 1919, it has fascinated generations of scientists. For the best part of 20 years, it has been the abiding obsession of Dr. John Rick. He leads a team of scientists who continue to uncover this ruined secrets. Today, much of the structure is covered up to protect it from the elements. One has to go underground, deep into the temples of Chavin, to see what this place is really all about. And this is the place which has a... This extraordinary relic is called the Lanzon. And we think that there was probably a close control of sound in this area maybe with trumpets, shell trumpets sounding, or other sound effects. This was meant to be an otherworld experience. The Lanzon is in a position where it's meant to be fearsome. It's deep inside the dark bowels of the earth. Um, coming in here 3,000 years ago would have been an amazing experience. People didn't go underground in those days. Made out of a single piece of granite, it's four and a half meters high. Dr. Rick says it represents a human-like figure, but a human-like figure with claws, snake dreadlocks, and fangs. Just what was it meant to be, and what emotions would it have inspired in the people here thousands of years ago? Potential converts to the cult of Chavin could have been convinced of the validity of the cult and the power that the priests had to make the gods speak or otherwise provide experiences which were out of the range of human comprehension. Like masters of illusion, the effects were used to leave devotees awestruck. Chavin used a whole series of methods for getting inside the human mind. One of those that 
might seem most incredible, which you have very adequate proof for, is the use of psychoactive drugs. We find not only the representation of the drug plants themselves, we find representations of humans with the effects of the drugs, and we find the paraphernalia were used in the drug ingestion. So they're altering people's minds. Dr. Rick believes the drugs would have enhanced the experience, even amplifying the fear or wonder, allowing Chavin's priests to better manipulate the religious experience and, in turn, the followers. Coyote or San Pedro cactuses are probably as abundant here now as they were 3,000 years ago. The psychoactive effects produced by ingesting this cactus are well documented and it is still used by shamans or traditional healers to this day in Peru and other parts of the continent. Back at the makeshift laboratory there's yet more evidence of how these ancient worshippers were altering reality. Silvana Rosenfeld, a zoo archaeologist, logs dozens of different items carved from animal bones, evidence of drug use. We think that these were some sort of trays or tablets to put some um, snuff to psychoactive plants powder and they were used for snuffing. They probably used these uh, tubes. We, have, we find a lot of these tubes that were made of uh, bird bone. They polish the edge. And the carvings on these frescoes in the well-preserved circular plaza show how it was incorporated into their rituals. But a series of relatively recent discoveries have filled out an even more vivid picture of what may have taken place in these ancient ruins. The discovery of 20 of these shell trumpets by Dr. Rick opened up a whole acoustic dimension to what these ancient ceremonies may have been like. Over there, right near the circular plaza. Miriam Kola is an archaeoacoustics researcher with Stanford University who's been trying to piece together a soundtrack from another world. So I have here a replica, a modern reconstruction of an ancient patutu or a strombus galeatu shell trumpet. And you can see that it's carved and engraved and uh, it works like a modern trumpet. <laughs> She explains how a series of ducts and filters leading from the oracle at the top of the stairway lead directly into this small ceremonial plaza. And when the trumpets were played, the sound was amplified in extraordinary ways. We've made acoustic measurements that tell us scientifically how these ducts filter the sound. So now we're creating acoustical models in the computer that use this data to actually make a simulation or an oralization of the ancient times. So in the future, we'll have this for people to listen to. The sound frequencies of these ancient trumpets, something like the middle C on a piano, would have chimed exactly with the dimensions of these specially constructed stone passageways. One of the tricks of these acoustic effects would be to make it difficult to know where the booming sound was coming from. Enhancing the senses, even confusing them, appeared to be a design feature. This is a really good example of a series of ducts that line up, where you can see that they were capable of bringing light from the outside into this internal gallery space. Um, but you also get air that comes in here. So we've got ventilation providing good breathable air for people in here. We're also getting ventilation, which is carrying off humidity from the center part of this structure. And we've noticed even that there is smell transmitted. We get odors transmitted through these galleries or these ducts that communicate between the galleries. So all sorts of things might have been manipulated through the use of these lined up, roughly foot square ducts. They're particularly strong features of the architecture. The more you explore Chavin, the more mysteries it seems to uncover. Beneath the ruins is a complex tunnel network which stretches for miles. The people who built this monumental structure were also fine, 
hydraulic engineers. They built this complex network of underground drainage canals. And the archaeologists working here today are trying to understand exactly how they functioned in the hope that they can better conserve the site in the present day. Chavin was one of those societies in the world at a point of human development in which there was an attempt to establish authority. This is something that happened all over the world and led to the modern states that we know today. But what Chavin was really doing was creating a convincing system, a way of getting inside people's minds and reordering the way that they thought about the human being and culture in general. And that was to think that in fact there were some people in contact with the gods, some people who had that intimacy, that knowledge, that power which was conferred by the gods and that set them apart from the rest of the population. Fear, power and awe were all carefully stage managed to bombard the senses of the followers in captivating rituals. And Dr. Rick believes this was a precursor of modern day religion and the societal hierarchies we take for granted today. I think Chavin highlights how different the societies we live in today were from those that came before Chavin. These transitions were not easily made. People had to be convinced. The, the many, many thousands of year old life ways of people with relatively equal status that had to be restructured to get to where we are today. We live in a world so transformed we can't conceive of how it was before. Chavin is located at a point in the valley where two rivers converge. A geographic location archaeologists believe could have had supernatural significance, providing an ideal setting for the natural world to merge with the cosmos. Our thanks to Dan Collins for that report from Peru.